Okay, so we left off in class talking about the method of Lagrange multipliers. And the idea was that you're given some sort of problem that you need to solve, um, typically in the context of optimization. So, you know, you're trying to find the max or the minimum of some function that you're given. Uh, in this case, it's what I called f of x, y, and z. Um, the way I introduced it in class, we only had two variables um, for most of the examples. And then we did go ahead and uh, do an example with three variables uh, on the last day, um, last Monday, I guess it was. Uh, so this, this, works, this method works for any number of variables. And it's always subject to some sort of constraint. And the constraint in this case is what we're calling g of x, y, and z set equal to some constant value, uh, say, c. So this is the context in which um, Lagrange multipliers is useful. And the main idea here is really, uh, you know, we had this idea of seeing where certain level curves were tangent to one another, and uh, all these points of tangency are um, the feasible places where a maximum or a minimum of the original function f might occur. And the, uh, the long and short of this is, is Lagrange's method of how to test for where these points should occur is by looking at where um, these level curves should be tangent. Uh, remember that this is really saying the same thing. If I've got one curve that looks like this and I've got another curve, you know, the other level curve happens to look something like this, then any point where they're going to be tangent, they are going to have something in common other than just tangency uh, their normal vectors will also be uh, parallel at these points. All right, so one of the normal vectors might look something like this, and another normal vector might look something like this. Right, they don't necessarily have to be the same length or point in the same direction, um, but they do have to be parallel, meaning that they're scalar multiples of one another. And so this is the idea, right? This, this yellow vector that I drew here, this might be the gradient of G, this green vector that I drew here, this might be the gradient of f, um, and they're going to be parallel or scalar multiples of one another, however you want to say it, uh, at any point where the level curves are going to be tangent. And these are going to be the candidate points for where this max or min of f might occur. All right, so the actual method that's involved with Lagrange multipliers is basically to solve this system of equations where you've got the gradient of f is equal to some rescaling of the gradient of g. And here lambda is just your rescaling factor. Lambda is just some, uh, some scale or some real number. And as we saw in class, we also have to couple this up with the original constraint, which is g of x, y, z. You know, it could be even more variables than that equals uh, whatever this constant is that you start with. All right, so the idea is that um, behind the method is that you solve this system of equations. Uh, if it were um, functions of three variables, x, y, and z, then uh, this, um, this system in, the, in that case would be a system of four variables, and it would be a system of four equations. All right, the reason why is that the gradient in this case would be a three-dimensional object. So you would have one equation from each of the three gradient components. And your fourth equation would be the constraint itself at the bottom. And your th uh, four unknowns, your four variables, would be uh, x, y, z, and lambda would be your last one. All right, so this is a system that you should, uh, just algebraically speaking, you should be able to solve this system. So the, uh, the method is to set up the system of equations and solve it, and uh, this generates, 
Alright, this leads to a list of feasible solutions. Um, and when I say a feasible solution in this sense, I mean very specifically uh, points x, y, z where f might be maximized or minimized. So it's any places where f might be maximized or minimized. That's the idea here. And as we saw in class, this list of points could be quite long. Um, I think the most extensive one we saw in class had maybe six or seven um, points in total. Uh, you'd have to go back at your notes and look at it. Um, I could be misremembering and thinking of the next example we were going to do in class as opposed to one that we actually got to. But they can be quite extensive. You can get lots of these, uh, lots of points from using the method of Lagrange multipliers. And like we saw in class, this just generates a list for you, right? That's a list of feasible solutions. And what you'd have to do is go ahead and list them all out, actually plug all of these points into F, and just compare all the values that you get, right? Which value gives you the biggest? which value gives you the smallest values, smallest in the sense of being the most negative, perhaps, not necessarily the closest to zero. Um, and this will tell you uh, where f is maximized or minimized, subject to that constraint of uh, g being you know, constrained and set equal to some constant c. And I do also want us to take a second to remember you know, where this came from. Uh, you know, why that picture I drew above uh, of the tangent uh, level curves having parallel normal vectors and, you know, this corresponding to the gradient where this all comes from. So I just want to remind you of the sort of central uh, tenet of what we've been talking about here, which is that um, the gradient is always orthogonal to level curves. Right, so uh, the gradient being orthogonal to the level curves is really what makes all of this stuff work. And this idea of, ortho of orthogonality um, is really what makes this um, you know, important for us to look at in this course, which is entirely about applications of inner products. Um, in particular, the dot product. Uh, and how do we test for orthogonality? Well, we take a dot product and see if it's zero. So, the, you know, this, um, I just wanted to remind you, uh, since it's been a while since we've talked, I wanted to remind you that um, this is why this is an important thing for us uh, to look at in this course. All right, so if we go to the next page here, then we've got um, an example of how Lagrange multipliers can be used in an application. And <clears throat> this is very specifically an economics application. All right, so there are some words in here uh, that I just want to make you um, make you aware of, uh, some sort of um, economic you know jargon uh, that you may not have seen before. So uh, we've got a consumer who has a certain amount of wealth, uh, which we're calling W. That's just some number of dollars that they have available. And they're going to spend them on two goods. And these goods have different prices. Uh, good 1 will have price P1, and good 2 will have price P2. Um, so, you know, if these are uh, different candy bars or something, uh, you know, the price of Snickers might be a dollar a bar, and the price of... Um, you know, Hershey's uh, might be 89 cents a bar, you know, just as an example. Um, so, you know, when 
just because we call it wealth doesn't mean that it has to be a lot of money. Uh, you know, the person's um, wealth amount, W, could be as small as, you know, $4 or something. And they're trying to figure out um, how many different candy bars to buy. So uh, the quantities that they're going to purchase are what we're going to call Q1 and Q2. So in the example I just mentioned, um, if quantity, I'm sorry, if good one is Snickers bars, then uh, P1 would be the price of a Snickers bar, and Q1 would be the total number of Snickers bars that this consumer purchases with the amount of wealth that they have, meaning the amount of money in their, in their wallet. So um, Q2 would be uh, the quantity purchased of the other kind of candy bar, for example, um, Hershey bars. And price 2, P2, would be whatever the price of a Hershey bar is. And um, the way it is right now, we're not really, uh, you know, just with wealth, price, and quantities, we're not really talking about optimizing anything. They've got a certain amount of money to spend, so it's not like we can minimize their cost or something like that. Like, they're, they're walking into the store and they're going to spend, say, four dollars on candy bars. So what we want to do, the thing that we are trying to optimize, which you can see down here, we're trying to maximize something. And what we want to maximize is what's called the consumer's utility. So this is really the big operative word um, that may be completely, uh, completely new to you if you've never seen um, any sort of economics uh, or taken an economics class. So what we're trying to maximize here is, is what's called the, uh, the consumer's utility. And utility is this very, I'm trying to think of the right word, maybe ambiguous, um, vague kind of uh, thing in economics. And basically utility is how useful something is to you. And usefulness obviously is a subjective thing. But in this case, for candy bars, uh, utility would be how much enjoyment you would get out of the, the different kinds of candy bars that you would buy, as an example. Um, another kind of utility might be caloric intake. Um, you know, if you're trying to hit a certain number of calories by uh, restricting yourself or, or um, you know, using a certain kind of diet, then your utility might be your nutritional, um, nutritional benefit to caloric intake. And, you know, this is a hard thing to measure uh, because it is subjective, number one, and because, number two, if you are talking about something like candy bars, you're likely not going to uh, be talking about caloric intake or nutritional intake or anything like that. You're likely going to be talking about the, the enjoyment of, of the candy bars themselves. Uh, and so this can be a notoriously hard thing to quantify. But we're going to suppose that um, our consumer has a very specific utility function. And it's given by you here in the second to last line. And the idea is that their utility function is going to be based on the quantity of each thing that they purchase. So maybe you really, really like Snickers bars, and you're not so crazy about Hershey's bars, but you still like them. Then, in this example, you know, maybe um, uh, Snickers bars, which you really enjoy, maybe they should have, here, let me uh, highlight it with a different color here, maybe they should have a, an exponent, which is relatively large. And if you look down in this line down here, alpha is some number between 0 and 1. And so, let's say you absolutely love Snickers bars, and you don't like, um, you don't like uh, Hershey's bars at all. Then maybe, for example, if if you're that consumer who really likes Snickers and you don't like Hershey's, well, then maybe alpha for you should be one. You see, we're restricting alpha to be strictly between zero and one. It could be zero or one. So, uh, you know, if you really love Snickers and you really don't like Hershey's bars well, maybe um, alpha should be one for you, because that would mean that your utility is just straight up the number of Snickers bars that you consume, and it has no, you know, there's no bearing whatsoever uh, on Hershey's bars for you. 
and say you're the other way around. Say you really don't like Snickers bars and Hershey's bars are your favorite thing in the world. Well, then maybe alpha for you should be zero because that would get rid of Q1 from this calculation. And instead, one minus alpha one would just be equal to one if alpha is zero. And so that would just be saying that your utility is exactly the number of uh, Hershey's bars that you buy and consume. And, you know, in either of these two extreme examples, where you absolutely love one and hate the other, uh, it's not too hard to see that maximizing your utility would just be maximizing the number of the thing you love and minimizing the number of the thing you don't love. Um, it becomes much more nuanced when we have to consider this very general case of, you know, I, I kind of like Snickers bars and I kind of like Hershey bars, but maybe there's a little bit of an imbalance in how much I, I actually enjoy one versus the other. And that's what these exponents, this alpha and this one minus alpha, that's what they take care of. Uh, they sort of take care of the balancing act of, uh, you know, the fact that one commodity or one good might actually provide um, a little bit more enjoyment than the other. All right, so this is, um, this is the idea here uh, behind this this two commodity or two good um, utility function. And what we want to do is maximize the consumer's utility. And what that means for us is we're going to have to to weigh the fact that the consumer only has so many dollars to spend. That's this W value. And they know the price of each of the goods, P1 and P2. What we need to do is figure out the quantities of each one that will make the consumer have the most utility from that purchase. Meaning it could be the most enjoyment from it. It could be, you know, the most optimal caloric intake, or uh, it could be like the best, um, I don't know, fuel mileage or something like that, right? It's whatever, uh, whatever is useful to that consumer is what this utility function uh, tries to quantify. So this is a very common thing in economics to try and maximize these utility functions because this, if you can maximize, try to model and maximize a consumer's utility function for a given set of goods or commodities, well then you can start to try and predict how, assuming that consumer is rational anyway, you can start to try and predict how that consumer will spend their money and this tells you what to stock on your shelves, what not to stock on your shelves, how much of each thing should be out there, uh, you know, on, on the shelves for people to purchase, um, how many of each kind of car, and what fuel efficiency, and what stuff in the interiors of cars uh, people really get a lot of utility out of versus who don't get a lot of utility out of it. It can tailor how uh, companies advertise to certain demographics versus others etc, etc, etc. All right, so trying to understand um, these utility functions and how to maximize utility functions is sort of a fundamental thing in, uh, in microeconomics, meaning economics on the small scale, on the scale of individual consumers. All right, so what we're going to do next is, hopefully now that we have the language, um, you know, we're okay with the language, now is to try and go ahead and uh, actually find the maximum for this utility function. And because we're set up here as trying to find the maximum of some function, and it is, it's not maybe necessarily explicitly stated this way, but it is subject to a constraint. So in the next uh, installment of this lesson, uh, in the next video, um, we're going to start off by figuring out what the constraint equation should look like for this situation. And uh, once we set that up, we're going to be able to use the method of Lagrange multipliers to go ahead and figure out um, what, uh, what quantities of each of the goods will actually go ahead and, and maximize this consumer's utility. All right. So uh, see the next video for more details.